Hello my friends, this is Coxter. First, let me warn you, this is going to be a long video, but hopefully it will help people make a place for themselves in the YouTube Atheist community. Here is how I will approach this topic. I will begin with a short introduction, then I will explain why I think my advice is worth listening to. Thirdly, I will explain why I believe the big channels became so big and more importantly how they managed to remain big. Fourthly, I will discuss the biggest mistake made by YouTubers. And finally, I will explain how I believe people can improve their ranking on YouTube. This video was brought after I listened to Thunderfoot's recent comment regarding the state of YouTube, comparing the large channel like his to big trees in a forest that don't let through enough light for the smaller trees. His video was followed uh, by Letemway, who said that the YouTube atheist community is dying. Their videos ruffled quite a few feathers and many people shimped in their own opinions. To me, Thunderfoot and Letemway's comments had an effect similar to giving a hypochondriac a reason to feel bad about him or herself, and they didn't help at all with the current situation. Fortunately, there are people like TOS100 whom I believe when he says that he wants to help small upcoming channels, like he helped me. I also believe the others who announce that they will also help, but only the future will tell if they will keep their promises or not. Why do I think I can help with this particular video? I have been a 24 hours, 7 days a week YouTuber for a week now. I watch all my subscribers' videos and even those produced by people I'm only friends with. I go as far watching the videos they favorited and liked. I'm retired and yes, I have the time to do this. 12 months ago I chose to make YouTube my hobby and thus giving my life a new meaning by contributing actively to the cause of militant atheism and at the same time developing my skills in filming, editing and scripting videos. When I first started I didn't even own a camera and I had never filmed nor edited anything. To me movie and video making were an impenetrable Hollywood secret. Today, when I watch my first videos, I am happy to see that I have improved since that time and even if I have reached a certain level of quality nowadays, there is still a lot of room left for improvement and learning so that I will become even better in the future. A hobby always costs some money and I have to admit that I'm certainly not rich. However, I'm always trying to save a few dollars here and there in order to keep my hardware up to date. Unfortunately, I live in a country where partnerships aren't possible. This makes me a little angry because I have not seen any country joining the partnership program since more than a year. I find this particularly unfair when we are talking about a company like Google who should be promoting the improvement of video makers independent where they come from. Please do not misunderstand me. I'm doing fine and I don't need YouTube money to live. But if I were to receive only a $100 a month, I could upgrade my computer or buy makeup and disguise for my impersonations. I could even buy some drinks for people I'd love to see join me in front of the camera while turning here outside. This brings me to point three. 
I liked Thunderfoot's video about the large trees growing way up high in the sky and not letting enough sunlight shine down on little trees. However, his analysis was not complete and this is understandable considering his perspective. Which is why I want to push his reflections even further. 2006 was certainly the right moment to start a new channel on YouTube. I fully agree with him on this point. But let's not forget that most of the channels that grew at the time were channels with a certain quality level or at least offered something new that people like to watch. During the same period, some pioneers died on their way to fame while others simply didn't quite make it to destination. Among those who eventually made it, quite a few just gave up. And for these reasons, I believe things are basically the same they were five years ago. And now let's take a look at the 10 biggest mistakes people make. And please keep in mind this is my opinion. Mistake number one. A lot of people are posting videos they would never watch if anybody else has posted them. It is very disrespectful of the audience to expect them to be satisfied with a lower standard of production you claim for yourself. Mistake number two. Some videos are text only. YouTube is a visual platform and if I want to read, I would pick up a book. It's always hard to get people's attention and harder still to keep it. Always keep in mind that many people start watching a video so that they can listen to what is going on while doing other things. Mistake number three. Some videos only present a voice over a static picture. Come on, how many times you do you have to be reminded that YouTube is a visual platform? If I want to listen to people, I turn on the radio or go to a radio podcast. Sure, you do manage to keep the attention of people who are doing more than one thing at a time, but you lose those who actively watch. It's not entertaining. Mistake number four. Too many videos are filmed using a camera from the computer Stone Age. When you decide to post videos, it becomes a part of your life, some kind of hobby. But remember that most hobbyists have a certain amount of pride in what they are doing and constantly want to have the latest and the best they can afford. Would you go fishing with a branch, some string and a rusty hook at the end? Do you know any fisherman who would? Mistake number five. The sound sucks. This is the worst kind of experience ever. We shouldn't have to concentrate in order to understand what people are saying. Bad sound editing with sounds, sound levels all over the place is just as bad. Mistake number six. The video is not edited at all. If you can make your point in three minutes, but your video is 20 minutes long, you must have an awful lot of awfully good friends to have any views at all. Mistake number seven. The editing is poorly done. Editing is not a talent passed on to you through your mother's milk. It must be learned. And learning is the most important part of the art of video making. Don't post a video if you couldn't be bothered to watch something similar produced by someone else, as I mentioned in mistake number one. Mistake number eight. Too many people overestimate themselves and the quality of their productions. Be open to constructive criticism and even ask for the opinion of others, especially from those who have been around longer than you. Please learn from them. Mistake number nine. 
You believe that your work is done once you have posted your video. You don't communicate with your audience and you don't reply to their comments. And even worse, don't follow up videos based on the comments you have received. This is one reason many big channels lose subscribers after a certain period of time. Mistake number 10. You don't help other channels and you are not part of what I like to call a rope team. A group of like-minded people pulling in the same direction. This particular mistake leads me at this time to an analysis of the big channel success. Afterwards, I will discuss my own rope team. So, simply look at Thunderfoot's YouTube homepage and check his recent activity. Check which videos and which channels he thumbed up or favorited. Then go take a look at those channels and you will find out that they are nearly all members of his rope team. A rope team should be included in someone's cool box. It's a great tool and it works. Why do you think Happy Cabby is selling space in his cool box for $10 the next three months? What's not so cool is when people don't understand that this should be a win-win situation. I often go to people's homepage and watch the video that plays automatically because I like to check the person's recent activities. I sometimes see all the videos I have not seen before and I like to send a friend request or subscribe to the channel. However, far too often I see the very big channels listen, uh, listed in the cool box and I can't understand why. What is the big idea for an under 300 sub channel to advertise big channels? Why not instead exchange this space with friends and channels aimed at the same market? Build your own rope team and help my mother. By the way, I still have some space available in my own cool box for some friends. Now let me speak about competition and the ever-changing media world. People have a limited amount of time for media consumption, whether it be television, YouTube, computer games and so on. The reason for this limitation is very simple, it's something called real life. Because of this limitation people choose what they find most enjoyable. It can be YouTube when television has nothing more interesting to show and the competition for a young audience is even more challenging when you take into account video games. The YouTube video has to be more interesting than the games people can play at the push of a button. So what's left from an already limited amount of time we are t talking maybe about one hour a day. Now there are YouTubers who earn money from their videos and for them every minute you spend watching a competitor's video represents a financial loss. So please don't expect them to help you chip away at their income. Now let's talk about shoutouts. Shoutouts can be dangerous. I do a lot of them and have done so right from the beginning. Fortunately, I have never made a bad choice. All those I have supported have been great. They and their channels have grown as I expected. Today some of them have even more subscribers than I do and that's great. But there is always the possibility of making a bad choice, like my friend Tilden, for example. He had given Heiruka a shootout and had to distance himself from her when she turned out to be a racist. You can encounter another type of problem when you refuse to give shoutouts to people because they simply don't deserve it and the quality of their productions just isn't there. What do you think their wounded pride makes them to do to you?
One last point. How we behave towards our friends' videos. When I watch the All Activity page, I'm always astonished that very few people give their friends thumbs up. It is said that very few of us give a favorite rating to our friends' videos. Doing it more frequently helps us all to have a greater presence on YouTube. A thumb up doesn't cost anything but helps to generate views. If a friend's video is not absolute crap, you should use the thumb up and even favorite the video if it was simply good. After a few days you can delete it from your favorites but at least you helped. Commenting also helps. It's recorded in your last activity box. It does not need to be a great piece of insightful wisdom. Just a smiley it's enough to let your friend know that you watched his video. The comment section in my videos is always open for both fans and critics. Video replies do not even need my approval. People are always welcome to become involved in the exchange of opinions. Anyway, that's all I had to say. I hope you have found this video helpful. Feel free to ask any questions and I will do my best to answer them all. If ever it gets out of hand, I will do a follow-up video. I'm sorry it took so long, but there were a lot of things that had to be said. This was Gogster. Hmm. Caress you and thank you very much. Ciao.